Right, how's it going? Um, my name is Barry Gaynor. I'm the Jarl of the Fingal Living History Society. Uh, the society's been running about 17 years this year. Um, we started off as uh, members of uh, different clubs and uh, we came together to form, form this society. Um, we had left one, one club, as I said, and formed this club. And we called it Moloch and Tork at the time, which was a uh, curse of the, of the boar. And that lasted in general for about two years, maybe less. And then uh, we changed the name to uh, Fingal Living History Society. So um, from there, then our, our first probably new members into the club when we started. The club mainly started because we were doing stuff with other clubs, as I said, and we wanted to form our own group in the Fingal area, um, where we were from, from Swords. So we, we started that, and uh, we were initially a combat group at the start, just doing combat, no living history or, or crafts. And from there, it just built. Uh, we got in some new members, and uh, the combat scene was, was going it was going well, but we wanted something more to, to put into the shows. Um, and we were starting to go to events in England to see what they were doing, which would be living history events as well, as they call them LHE, so living history events or exhibits. And uh, so we added, added into what we were doing. And we got our first two tents made, which were done by Ronald Kane from uh, the old group in the North Clan Ulla. And, uh, Ronald then helped us make them with the, the help of his dad, Roy. And uh, the tents aren't like this, but they were like the A-frames that you might have seen in, in some of the other places are down earlier on today. Um, from there then, we were probably the first group in the country to have tents. And uh, from there then, we got a few more members in. We got a guy called Big Rob, who obviously lives up to his name. The guy was like a tank. And, uh, a couple, of, a couple of other guys that came, came and went over, over the years. But we built up slowly, we got in a, another few tents which brought us up to five. And then uh, we made a good friendship with, uh, with Ragnar Broder Spy, which is Ian Barber. And uh, poor Ian, we killed his car for years, we did towing our stuff everywhere. And uh, so it went from the two tents to, to five and Ian was bringing our stuff and then the next year came around and we had maybe six and another bit of equipment and then the next year came around and we had that up to seven or eight and uh, it eventually then we just got so much for Ian's tent but the, the club has gone from strength to strength over the years like doing some of the the bigger shows around we done the Volvo races out in Galway there that was that was great times 70,000 people a day and we done the tall chips in Dublin and Belfast, over a million people in three days each one. Uh, we done all the front tariff events and the build-up events over the last few years. So it's been quite exciting to do, and quite quite proud that we were all part. We were part of it. Um, the actual main event in St Anne's Park was seen by like seventy thousand people over the weekend. Hiya, um, my name is Jackie Wright, and I work together with Fingal Living History Society, who some of us are here today. Um, I'm a, a reenactor and all the pottery that you see on the table here are copies from the Viking period, 9th, 10th century. They're work from archaeology and from museums, so they're copies of actual finds. And originally the Viking pottery was unglazed inside they fired their kilns in such a way that the glazes, um, they wouldn't have fired high enough. And also, pottery during this time had a very low status. So, um, the helmet is actually a clay model. Some people think it is metal. I've managed to make it look like it's metal by using certain glazes. And it's a helmet from Vendel in Sweden, from the 8th century, uh, from a king's grave. Join a few cans of soda with a few of my friends, and they started talking about reenactment, about swords and shields, and I was 
I, was, I said I didn't believe them, so they told me to come along to one of their trainings. And I literally saw the leader of our group and his brother Brian with uh, a sword and a spear in their arms fighting each other. And I just went, this is me. <laughs> I am in this. And that was about seven years ago. I don't know, there's something about it that you just don't seem to be able to get anywhere else. I can't put my thumb on it. I'm, Done now. I'm showing, currently I'm showing the different stages of, of textile production. So first of all, we've got unwashed wool. And this then would need to be washed first as it would actually be quite full of lanolin, which is quite a smelly, oily substance that gives the sheep the waterproofing. So that gets washed. And when it's washed, it would be in this state. So it'd be quite tangled. So then it would need to be carded. So you'd have something like this. These are more modern co carders, but they can, they still show the same. So this would be used to actually get rid of all the tangles in the wool. So this would be combed several times. And then once it's combed, it's ready for spinning. So the spinning wheel at the time for the Viking era would have been the drop spindle, which is this. So the spinning wheel itself doesn't come in until about the 15th or 16th century. So before that, they would have used this technique to spin all of their wool. And it's this weight here. This is a weight that pulls, pulls the thread when you spin it. So that's what gives it the tension. When you've, when you've got it hooked up, you would then tease your wool out and then you would gently spin it. And this is how you twist it into wool. Then this would have been used to weave, to weave the fabric that we would have used for each piece of clothing that we'd be wearing. So it would take a, quite a long time to be actually able to get enough fabric to make a single piece of clothing. So at the time in the sagas, they used to say that if, that if a woman made a shirt for a man who was not her husband, that was the equivalent to adultery. Surely from the amount of work that that woman would have had to have done to actually produce a single piece of cloth. So that was one way for a woman to have committed adultery. And then clothing was quite important. It was a, because again, the amount of work that was gone into it, it would be used as a way of giving, if you wanted to be very generous to a guest, you would have actually given them a tunic or a shirt, and that was a very big gift, at the, a very generous gift at the time. And that, was, that would show kind of how much, how much you regarded your guest, or again, maybe how, how rich you were, that you'd be, able to, you'd be able to actually spare a shirt to be able to give to a guest. The reds come from Madder, the yellows from Wells, and then the blues, would come from a plant called woad. Now if you were a woad guy, you weren't a very popular person in the whole process of things. So the woad plant is the leaves you actually want. So you harvest the leaves of the plant. But to actually make the blue dye, you would need to actually um, steep all of the leaves in male urine. So, and this would have to be a male urine because female, female hormones would have interfered with the dyeing process. So you had to have collected a good big bucket of male urine. You had to leave it for two weeks and then you had to boil it. And the, pro, the chemical in the urine would actually get rid of all of the oxygen in the dye bath. And then once you put your wool in and the wool absorbs the dye, when you lift that out of the dye bath, oxygen will react with the wool and turn it blue. So that's how you get the, the rich blue colour. But if you were to have a lot of blue, like a lot of blue tunic, that was a sign of wealth because you would have needed a lot of people to actually have gone out and collected all enough woad dye to make a full tunic. So it was a, it was a status thing, even though the poor woad dye themselves was probably, normally they were told to live on the edge of the village because the process would stink a lot. <laughs>
funny t-shirt talk to the hand talk to the hand because the bollocks is not listening hello hello man in the funny t-shirt hello world <laughs> oh what are you doing here man? <laughs> should, I, should I put the mic on <laughs> Shane Higgins here at Viking Camp 101 I'm here with my friend, I love her. <laughs> Please speak clearly into the mic. Who gives a fuck? Shut up, you, you baldy bastard. Here you go. I some speedy Gonzales. Leave it, leave it. Can you hear me? The bloody cano. Why is he leaving it then? Because I've been arrested for being a bloodbath. <laughs> not unusual to be loved by anyone. It's not unusual 